All right, here is my PIC development board. I have some external switches connected to it besides the ones that are mounted on it. And you notice LED 4 is blinking while LED 1 is on. The subject of this video is we're going to look at hardware interrupts. That way I can sit here and switch LED 1 off and on without disturb well it will if I sit here and hold it down of course I'll stop it but what an interrupt will do is it will halt the execution of the main program jump to what is called an interrupt service routine then go back where it left off when the interrupt occurred so we will be looking at how interrupts work here in this explanation, I'll be using the PIC 16F84A because it's a simpler version of a PIC chip. It makes illustration far easier. But you'll find this and a lot more in more advanced PIC chips, such as the PIC 16F628A and so forth. But let's take a look what we have here. We have an AND gate that goes your CPU has an interrupt pin. Now all of this is internal to the microcontroller. The main CPU of course has an interrupt connection. That tells the interrupt, okay I'm executing this program, maybe I'm in a delay loop or whatever, and somebody is getting my attention to, st to save the information that I stop what I'm doing, save the location, and then go to an interrupt service routine. For any interrupt to work, we have to uh, set the global interrupt enable bit. This is in the interrupt control register. In this particular, in the F84, I have four interrupt sources. The timer zero overflow, pin RB0 has an external interrupt. You have the port B pull-up resistors, that's PB3 through 7. And you have the EEPROM interrupt. In this series, I'm only interested in the timer 0 interrupts and the port B pull-up resistors. Each, to enable whichever particular interrupt, you have an interrupt enable bit and then you have the interrupt flag itself so all of these have an interrupt enable and an interrupt flag RB interrupt flag and so forth here is the interrupt logic for the PIC 16F 628A has everything you saw in the F84, plus it added a bunch more. This is what PIC does, which is really good. As their chips become larger and more complex, they tend to build onto what they've already done, at least in the lower end chips that I've been programming. Again, we still have a series of ANDs. We still have enable bits. And each device over here has an enable and flag bit through an OR, through an OR, and to the main interrupt at the CPU. This is a look inside our interrupt control register. It's, it's an 8-bit register labeled from bit 0 to bit 7. Your global interrupt enable bit is bit 7. If you set that to a high or 1, you turn on the entire interrupt structure. Bit 5 turns off and on your timer 0 overflow. Bit 3 turns off and on your RB, your port B pull-up resistors on PB3 through, uh, PB4 through 7. And down here you have what is called an inner, the port B pull-up flag. Anytime you have a interrupt, be it the pull-up resistors, timers, or whatever other device, it sets a interrupt flag, such as this down here at PB0. 
if I have three or four devices hooked up, how do I know which one I go to? You check the flags. If the flag is set, you know that, hey, somebody pushed the appropriate switch somewhere, and then I do whatever I program it to do. And before I, uh, when I get through with the program, I will clear the flag and return to where the interrupt occurred. Here we are looking at the PIC16F84 memory map. It consists of a couple of things. We'll talk about the stack momentarily. Your memory in this particular chip is 1024 bytes from 0 hex to 3 FFF hex. Note that when you hit the reset switch or it first powers up, it will go to location 0. It will look it will look at that point to know where setup is and what to do next. For our discussion here as well, we have the peripheral interrupt vector. That's all those hardware interrupts we discussed earlier. Uh, I can blow it up a bit for you. It's at four hex. So whatever what happens is when you reset, you usually have a in this space here between zero and four, which is about three bytes. You will have uh, usually a go to whatever setup routine and the address for that. And for the peripheral interrupt vector, which is at four down through here, you will place your interrupt service routine. And the compiler knows where this is. You don't have to write this out. The compiler places it where it should be. Now, let's talk about the hardware stack, which is up here. By the way, this is a 13-bit address bus. And the hardware stack is separate from the memory locations. What the stack is... If you have a call, which is call a subroutine or return, or return from subroutine or return with a literal and W, any kind you have a uh, jump to subroutine or an interrupt, the processor will stop what it's doing. It will save the program counter on the stack. So let's just take an example. I'm sitting here doing... Um, I get, an inter I get an interrupt, the address where I'm working is put on the stack, I jump to the interrupt service routine, but I also have a call to a separate subroutine from the interrupt service routine. Okay, when I do that call, the address <laughs> within the interrupt routine is also pushed onto the stack. Both are stored there, so when I come back from the call, and I exit from the interrupt service routine, I should be able to pull my addresses back. On the first interrupt, look at it this way. Look at it as a pile of dinner plates. I get a interrupt. I jump to the ser interrupt service routine, but before I do that, I save, maybe I put a note where I'm at on plate one, lay it down in the lay it down on the table. I go to the interrupt service routine. I have to call to a subroutine. So I make a note where I'm at before I jump off to that routine and lay it on top of the first plate and so forth. You're limited to eight jumps to eight jumps total. If you have more than eight jumps, your first one that went in is basically going to fall off the table. It's going to disappear. It's going to be pushed out. So when you do a return, when you're doing return or return from interrupts, it, it pulls it back opposite of the order in which it went in. So the last one is pulled out first and the first one is pulled out last. I guess it's first in, last out. That's how stacks work. And this is true for any microcontroller out there. Let's look at this from the viewpoint of an Arduino, which many of you are more familiar with. Disregarding the define and byte 
designations up here. This, for instance, is going to be would be your interrupt service routine in this particular program. Your setup, of course, is going to set up the physical characteristics of the I.O. pins, and it will attach the interrupt to the, of course, rising from high, from low to high, to your interrupt service routine toggle. And the rest of the time is just going to sit down here in loop. This assumes, of course, that you have a switch or some kind of electrical change, in this case on uh, digital pin 2. When that rises, wherever this is doing down here in this little loop is saved on the stack. I jump up here, do my toggle routine. I uh, change the state of the LED that is blinking, wherever it's blinking at. In this case, it's, it's on pin 9. The LED is, I just changed the state of the LED on pin 9. Then I pull the return address off the stack and go back to loop. When I set up my PIC programming, I set it up in many cases to resemble what you see in Arduino. And this is what you'll find on my programming sheets. Of course, when you do a reset, I'm going to go over here to memory location 0 that I talked about earlier. And then I'm going to tell it, go to setup. That's just a jump. We go down here to setup. It does the same thing as setup does in Arduino. Sets up your various hardware, your interrupts, and your other stuff. Loop is pretty much identical, except you don't have the brackets. You have loop. You do your main program. You go to loop. It does the same thing it does in Arduino. Up here... At origin 0x04, this is your interrupt vector. Whatever, whenever I get an interrupt, it will jump, it will save the location down here in loop, wherever it was on the stack. It'll go over here and execute whatever is at origin 0x04. The interrupt vector does whatever, pulls the return address back off the stack and back off to loop it goes. So do you see the resemblance here? They all work basically the same. Here is an actual example working interrupt service routine at 0x04. Be advised what you want to do when you jump in besides your uh, interrupt program uh, routine saving your address from where it jumped over to here, you want to immediately save your W register and your stat status register so that when you exit the ISR routine, you can go back to exactly what you were doing when the interrupt occurred. All right, what am I doing here? Okay, just as an example, I loaded uh, 0x01 so I can change the port B uh, bit 0 so I can toggle it. I call an external subroutine called toggle. It changes the it toggles the on it toggles the LED on and off on port B PB0. I delay 100 milliseconds and this is important. In this case I was using the port B pull-up resistors. Whatever flag, depending on what I'm using, I have to clear that flag. In this case, the RV pull-up resistor interrupt flag has to be cleared to zero. Now I restore W register, I restore status register, and I issue a return from interrupt routine. That's it. So that's the thing you want to do. One, when you get here, save your W register and your status register. You do whatever routine you designed it to do. You clear the interrupt flag of the device that sent you, of the interrupt that sent you here. Got to clear that flag. Then you retrieve your W and status register and go back to where you were before. 
And here is the actual hardware connections, in this case a PIC-16F628A. All of this works exactly the same, the exact same electrical connections and the exact same programming. So this completes this brief introduction to interrupts. And the next following videos, we'll look at individual interrupt devices. Thanks for watching. Catch the rest of the videos in this series and visit my website at www.bristolwatch.com. Thanks for listening.